Hey guys, it's me. Real quick, before the episode starts, um, the audio's kind of poor, so sorry in advance. I don't know what happened. The software just kind of, the settings got messed up. I really don't know, but the last two episodes were like this. I didn't notice till the end of this episode, so I'm sorry. Stick with me. I'll get the audio fixed in the upcoming episodes, so stay tuned, stay with me, stay spinning, still spinning, and I love you. Sorry in advance. I'm a one-man show. Give me a break. I love you. This podcast is sponsored by Athletic Truth Group, a sports training gym in Clearwater, Florida that specializes in pound-for-pound strength training through the deepest possible ranges of motion in order to bulletproof the joints while transforming athleticism and elasticity. The owner, Ben Patrick, claims that his new system of training is far superior for athletes than any other traditional programs out there since they stem from powerlifting and bodybuilding and do not come close to covering the intricacies of the human body in relation to athleticism. Ben would love for you to check out his YouTube channel, Athletic Truth Group, where he gives all his secrets away in daily YouTube videos, which are designed to give you the real solutions that can immediately apply to your training. Thank you to ATG for sponsoring this podcast. Boys, still spinning podcast. We're still spinning. We're rolling. We're moving. We're doing it. Episode 51. We're out here. I got my first sponsor. What's good? We're really making moves. I really thank all of you for your support. And if you want to help me even more, just do all the free things. You could just like, subscribe, rate it, share it. Those help me out so much, and I really appreciate all the love. I've been getting great feedback, and if you want to help me out even more, my Twitch you can subscribe to. That's a paid subscription, but if you have Amazon Prime and Twitch Prime, it's free. And Patreon, you could be a Patreon, a patron for $1 a month, and that really helps me. And my dream is coming true little by little thanks to you guys. And episode 51 is my man Daniel Back from Jump Science. I've talked to him for years over my dunk journey. He's been a huge help in training and just what goes into everything and he's been responsive and he's helped me so much uh learn from helping my knee pain to helping my training to just all different aspects i I used his program back in the day and i've been talking to him for so long we finally got to link up it was a great conversation i got to understand his story how he got into jump training his passion for jump training it's just it was just so awesome and he's really good at articulating the science behind jump training into dumbed down words that I can understand um, that just makes sense and it makes it makes it understandable to why things work and it was just really great we talked about uh, like strength training periodization and um, how to know when to stop training and kind of go back to elast- elastic training like it's just the, the balance the art of the training it's really it's re- really fascinating and I'm just so glad we finally got to link up and have this conversation because I've been meaning to talk to him for a long time he's been a guest that a lot of you have uh, requested. So here it is, Daniel Back from jumpscience.com. Still spinning in this universe. Let's go. Thank you again. We're almost at 20K on YouTube. What's good? All right, see ya. Toodaloo. I just gotta work and you know I'm doing that. Never stop, never stop, always in the pack. Locked in the path, never getting off track. Whatever I lack, add it to my bag. And I got plenty more where that came from. And my price is right, I never change. Bro, I don't get it done, get it done right, and that's every day, that's my life. Oh, that's what is up, Daniel? We're live. Um, great to finally meet you. We've talked a bunch. Um, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for making some time. Yeah, man. Good to meet you. Uh, glad to be on here. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Is this your first podcast? Uh, I think I might have done a couple in the past. Really? That's pretty cool. Like jump related or just... Yeah, yeah, like training related. Um, not any that were, you know, so popular as Dunk Life, probably. Really? That mean that that means a lot to me. I mean, I did ask my all my like subscribers on YouTube, and you popped up a, a bunch. I've always ha- wanted to have you on, and like I've always mentioned you a lot of my videos and stuff like that. So you're definitely like someone who people want to hear from. So I'm I'm pretty excited for this. So um, first thing I want to say is huge fan of your information. I found your website Jump Science long time ago it's really helped me i still use a lot of your principles and your stretching stretching was a huge one for me and first thing i want to say is i actually bought your program i don't know which one it was i think you had did you have multiple or like multiple versions there's been there's been a couple versions yeah so yeah i bought one of them and what stood out to me was that you one of the first because i did jump manual i'm sure you know all the programs i did jump manual first um I did air alert too, but like only for like two weeks and it was just like, I didn't feel anything from it. Um, and then I was kind of against programs, but then when I found your website, it was so much good information that just like was logical to me. And then when I tried your program, it was like, 
the first thing I remember like that really stood out was that you like diagnosed the person first because like, I was very inflexible. So it said like, OK, if you're this do this part of the program. Like if you have, if you can't do these flexibility tests, which I failed and like still fail, I think, which is a huge part of my training right now. And I was like, wow, that's really cool because it's not just like a weighted thing. It's like definitely more geared towards the athlete. So that was really cool. And uh, I just want to like kind of get into how you got jump science, how you got the whole thing started and like how you got into tr training in general. Okay. So, um, well, I, when I was about 12, I got pretty obsessed with basketball. Cool, yeah. And uh, I had an older brother who, you know, he and I would, like, play. We used to play in the alley, and he would, like, you know, run up and try to dunk or try mm -hmm. to grab the rim or whatever. And uh, at the time, I was, like, too young, too short, and I was like, man, I can't even imagine ever doing that. Yeah, yeah. But um, within, you know, the next year or so after, I think it was actually after my seventh grade basketball season, so I was 13 then, um, I, I got some weights at home. Okay. And uh, I knew just a couple things that my older brother had shown me. And so I started doing like squats and calf raises. Okay. <laughs> um, daily, pretty or like it was like five days a week. I would do Monday through Friday. And then I was like just in the driveway jumping mm -hmm. and trying to dunk. And uh, yeah, in, in about a year, I added like a foot to my vertical. Wow. Uh, grew grew four inches and ended up dunking in eighth grade. Wow. Okay. So yeah, around like thirteen, fourteen that age. Yeah, I, wow. I was. It was a little after turning fourteen. I How first tall were you at that age? Six foot even. Wow, that's really impressive, dude. At thirteen, fourteen. Jeez. Yeah. So I, I had a, a lot of success there, and, and just even at that age, like through that process, I kind of got obsessed with the whole training thing. Mm -hmm. uh, just seeing that change in my body, I kind of got hooked on that. Yeah. So uh, then, like, going forward into high school, I kind of explored some more things. You know, I was poking around the Internet and looking for stuff. And I ended up, um, when I was 15, I had, like, another really successful period where I added maybe, like, another six inches to my vertical in a couple months. And, uh, and again, that was with, a, growth, that was with a, a concurrent growth spurt, too. Wow, so, so that's, that, a good, that's a good chunk of vert right there. Yeah, so when I was a sophomore, I was touching the top of the box. You know, wow. At, at six foot three. Um, and so, yeah, somewhere in there, I just, I was like, man, this training thing is really cool. It kind of, mm -hmm. uh, taps into my, my love for science, love for math. Um, and then love for like a puzzle. I was, I think of like athletes are like a puzzle, like yeah. each person, you know, a puzzle you try to solve. So yeah, when I was, I think when I was like 16, probably I was like, man, I think I want to train people. That's dude. That's uh, really cool. So were you playing basketball in high school too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was playing basketball still. Unfortunately, that was the only sport I played. Okay. <laughs> um, I wish somebody would have, like, you know, grabbed me and made me run track. Yes, but, uh... track. I def, Dude, I was the worst runner. Like, I had no cardio, so I was very turned off from track. But I really wish I went into track so badly. Yeah, if I could go back, for sure. Yes, man. Um, the same way. <laughs> but, yeah, so I went um... – you know, I finished high school basketball career, had a pretty decent decent career. I ended up as like kind of like an all conference level player on varsity my senior year. Nice. Uh, but nothing nothing special. Um, in college, I walked on and made a D three team, and I played one season there. And then um, at this time, you know, I was kind of doing team workouts or whatever, but I was still like into training. Uh, like I loved that we had like a team lift that we had to do mm -hmm. and I would, you know, like I was into it, but I wasn't like planning my own stuff or anything. Um, but then before the second season, I actually ended up deciding not to play uh, basketball anymore because I had to get a job. I was broke. Mm. Uh, you know how college is. Yeah. Um, which at the time was kind of disappointing. But uh, after that, I started jump training on my own again mm -hmm. and had some success. Got up, you know, up over 40 inches at that time maybe like around 42 and, um, and then started training some other people. Uh, it was like just a couple friends at first and then, you know, a couple people had some success and then other people were interested because they'd see us like at the wreck, you know, yeah. like, doing jump training. Like what are these guys doing? Uh, -huh. uh so it kind of grew. I had like a little training squad. In That's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, that included like, you know, I had a, a guy, a friend of mine who was, uh, five, six and could hang on the rim. Was that the kid, Chris, that I've seen in the early yes. videos? I remember him. Yeah. That, he had, yeah, he had some like, really good progress. It was fun to watch him. One, yeah. One of the originals. Um, yes. I had a friend, Tom, who's like five foot nine and he, he trained for like five weeks and gained like five inches on his vertical, <laughs> and dunked, you know, it was Jeez. like, um, 
So yeah, I had some good success with just some friends and then, yeah, it sort of just turned into this thing where people knew I was sort of like the jump guy on campus or yeah. whatever. Um, <laughs> and I actually ended up, it was, it was a fall, uh, the, the basketball coach, the, my former coach, he asked me to run the team's um, preseason conditioning class. Really? And I was still just an undergraduate student. Yeah. But I was like working, actually, you know, worked for the university technically. Um, so yeah, it just kind of grew organically from yeah. that, just kind of getting training experience. Um, at the same time, I was getting an exercise science degree. Okay, that's what I was going to uh, ask if, like, you had a degree in it as well. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So I, was, so I was going to school for it as well, which it was nice because, um, you know, you learn the stuff in class, and then I was actually applying it as I, right. as I um, which is a huge thing in, in education that I believe in. Like, people don't apply the information enough. You know, you just kind of, they learn it, they memorize it for a test, and then they forget it, and then mm -hmm. they never, they go start to train somebody, and they don't really have that information in mind you know right um so then yeah somewhere in there i started posting some youtube videos um started writing some workouts i had a little blog and so it kind of grew organically online as well where you know people started asking me questions i was starting to give them workouts some other people had success just kind of mm -hmm. uh gradually grew over time until uh eventually made like you know a real website and had yes. uh, articles on there and all this stuff and then I think um, yeah by the time I was maybe 22 or so was when I like actually put out a program maybe 23 something like that and uh, and then yeah I was selling it for like seven bucks or something you know nice. uh, <laughs> But yeah, so there there wasn't any like huge moment in there. It just kind of gradually turned into yeah. something, and I, can, you know, tried to keep keep learning, keep improving the information on the site, um, and keep keep helping people as much as I can. And uh, that's that's jump science. That's what, dude. It's really cool because it's it's just I really like understanding where people come from because it always comes back to like people just kind of have just a passion for jumping and kind of like pushing their limits. So for you, when it was. Um, when you got your first dunk, when you did that, where you're like, oh, now I've, I just want to see how high I can go, and you just kept wanting to see, just push yourself as much as you can, or was it just like, learn as much as you can, or kind of both? Um, well, I certainly wasn't satisfied, because, mm -hmm. well, I mean, at that point, I gained 12 inches in a year. I was thinking like, oh, I'm just going to gain another 12 yeah. inches in a year. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's like, how fast can I get to the 80 inch vertical? Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. Uh, it didn't, obviously, that doesn't really work that mm -hmm. way, but... Um, so yeah, at the time I was thinking I had like super lofty goals, you know, it was like, okay, who's the highest jumper in the world? Like, I'm going to go get them, you yeah. know? Um, but I didn't really know much when I was 14. I just knew I did these two exercises and I jumped and I stretched and it worked for a short period of time. But um, there was obviously so much more to learn there, um, which, yeah, I guess the other kind of the realm that I was missing was like the plyometric side of things, like okay. the, the other explosive training. Uh, so then, yeah, when I was like 15 is when I was kind of exploring that and I did have a really successful period. Although, you know, kind of knowing what I know now, it's, I kind of wonder how much the plyometrics really played a role. But um, if you want to get a, I guess a kind of a peek into my obsession, like when I was Definitely. 15 and I was training, I had a, a, a room in the basement from my house, like my bedroom was down there, and uh, there was like a, a panel ceiling, right? And it was only about seven to seven and a half feet. Uh -huh. And I used to do uh, weighted jumps with a barbell where I had to hit my head on that ceiling every time. <laughs> okay. Uh, or, or the rep didn't count, you yeah. know? Um, and that was, and this is all on my own. Like there was no, my dad wasn't making me do that. No one was mm -hmm. telling me to do that. It was just like, yeah, I got an obsession in there somewhere. That's crazy. And, and I would, I would jump up the stairway and then mm -hmm. sprint down and jump back up and sprint down. Like, where'd you, you get know, these just, workouts? Just kind of made them up? Either made them up or the internet, man. Yeah. I, I don't really remember exactly. But I don't know if I've heard I, of the yeah. head, head button one yet, but I might try it. Yeah, the ceiling was soft enough. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, so um, so I, I think from all the information out there, a lot of people know how to get started and kind of get to that 40-inch. But I see, especially myself, is like 
once you hit like low 40s to 42 to 44 it's so tough to get to like those elite levels do you think there's like a as you've heard a, a million times i'm sure is like a genetic limit for people or do you think it's just like you really gotta it's to me it seems like you really gotta figure out what specific training they need yeah so i mean there's definitely the the component of you gotta you gotta start really solving the intricacies of that person yeah um you gotta you gotta look at you know are we maximizing uh how high we can jump at a given strength level that's one thing you know i think a lot of people have success with you know a combination of uh jumping and lifting mm -hmm. um and then they kind of just like roll with that combination for it's you know the foreseeable future them, yeah and and sometimes that means you end up you know depending on someone's background sometimes you end up with somebody who maybe squats a little more um or somebody who's you know squats well and maybe could jump a little higher at that strength level but they never really max it out mm. so they kind of just like keep pounding away at both okay and they never really max out like the explosive qualities like the uh you know elasticity and the ability to produce force really fast um so that's that's one thing and that's where you, you get into kind of my um the thing that I've preached for a long time about taking the break from lifting. Yes. Right. So I think that's that's one thing that can kind of help. Yeah, take people beyond that that initial surge that you tend to get. Uh -huh. Right. Um, I do think though that there's a point where it's like it gets super hard <laughs> to right? stop. To stop. To it get, well, it gets super hard to to make progress. Is what yes. I mean. Like even even if you take you know take some of these approaches. Um, it, yeah, because you run to this point where it's like I get stronger, and uh, I'm not jumping higher yet. So then I kind of back off the strength to try to peek out these other things. Yes. Uh, but then while I do that, my strength kind of goes away. Yeah, it's like a balance. I'm definitely struggling with that now. It's like, for me, it's like when I because I did like a strength phase recently where I did a lot of hex bar deadlifts because I heard that was a really good exercise and I was it felt it, like what I learned about it felt exactly what I needed, which was it was lifting the right amount of reps and it was like the type of muscles I was missing. And then when I did that, my athleticism went so far down like I, I lose athleticism so bad. I felt like, OK, like jumping wise, like explosive, but like my approach just suffered so much because it just felt like I was like packing on like weight. It just felt terrible. So do you, do you really believe in like phases of like strength training for a period of time and then elastic training or a mix? Uh, so, I mean, yes, phases, but the strength training is never by itself, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you don't ever want to just lift or at yeah. least not for very long. Uh, if you just lift, you just, I mean, you become a lifter, yeah. you know, and that's, and that's not, that doesn't work very well. So I, I think even when you are strength training, you've got to keep it in the right uh, proportion. You know, if you're an athlete, you always got to be an athlete first and a lifter second. Yeah. Uh, as long as you're healthy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I would say you pretty much always sprinting, jumping, training explosiveness, training elastic qualities. Uh, and then, yeah, you add strength to that for a while. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, you know, when strength starts to interfere with some things, or maybe when you get really fatigued, that's where you, you back off the strength. Yes. And then you try to peek out those other abilities. Um, yeah, I think that the, the wall that people run into, though, is it's just like, man, I, I, people have a hard time getting stronger at some point. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, well, I did a strength phase. Okay, but are you stronger than you've ever been? Not really. Yeah. So now I peak again, I just kind of end up in the same spot. Yes. So if, if there is a wall, I feel like the wall is more in the strength department. I, I guess I haven't had a lot of um, trouble. Like if someone is decisively stronger than they used to be, I don't have a lot of trouble translating that into athleticism. Makes sense, yes. The harder thing is can we actually get them stronger, <laughs> you know, stronger relative to their body weight than they've ever been? Um, I see. And that's basically like just yeah. literally trying to push weight they haven't pushed. Oh, I mean, gradually, not just like throw on weight, but just like getting them to a point that they can push weight, more weight. Right. And, and even, you know, hopefully not like, OK, he managed to deadlift more because he got a little better at deadlift technique. Right. You know, he got a little bit stronger grip. His back's a little stronger. 
But no, like we want to get to a point where, okay, these weights that used to be heavy are now not heavy anymore. Yes. You know, where this person is just like a different athlete. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if, if there is a wall, I feel like people run into a wall in that department. And I could talk about myself in that, in that area. Like sure. when I jumped my best, I probably only deadlifted like in the mid 400s. Totally. Um, <laughs> And well, I mean, I'm over, I'm yeah. 220, so it's not yeah. that big of a deal. Uh, and now, I mean, I've deadlifted 530 now, mm -hmm. but I'm not necessarily like across the board, stronger, more powerful. I'm way better at deadlift than I used to be. What technique uh, wise you're saying? Like you got yeah, just... te technique wise. Very interesting. interesting. And yeah, I, I guess, I guess technique would be the word for it. Um, yeah. You know, I used to like try to super straight back deadlift. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I use like, you know, I allow some slight rounding and my grip stronger and things like that. Right. But uh, in terms of, yeah, if you look at some of my other lifts or if you look at my power, uh, it's not necessarily higher relative to my body weight than it was five years ago. Mm. So are you so trying to get that up like, to get that vert up more? Oh yeah, I'm always trying. Yes, <laughs> <I'm not laughs> love kidding. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, my best jumping was in 2012, and then I, uh, shortly after my best jumping, I dislocated my foot. Damn. And I uh, have not returned to that same best jumping since, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Currently, I'd, or like in the last few years, I'd say that's probably should have been able to do it, but I've actually been more speed training myself mm -hmm. now than jump training. To get faster? Uh, yeah. Yeah, because so towards the end, this is another part of my, my story, I guess, like towards yeah. the end of college, uh, I started working with a couple track athletes from the university, and uh, I found out I was slow, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I wasn't real cool with that. Yeah. And so then, well, first, when I dislocated my foot, like I was able to run again before I was able to jump. Okay. So I kind of started to like casually explore that a little bit mm -hmm. then. Um, but then also track kind of became my new favorite sport to train people for because it's just like pure athletic development, you know, mm. um, which, you know, dunking is now too, but, uh, we still don't have like dunk teams at school, yes, you know, not yet. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, you can make a basketball player like super fast, make a jump super high. You can still be a terrible basketball player. Yeah. But track is just pure, yeah. you know, I how fast that. can you jump? I never sprint? really thought of it like that. How but I high like can that. you jump? How far can you jump? Like, it's just pure athletic development. development. So it's really made for, like, what I do. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, towards the end of college, I got more into track. And then um, when I moved down to Austin, Texas, I got this job at Acceleration, which is, like, a speed training facility. Um, nice. And I work with a lot of, like, football and track. It's just, like, speed-based speed sports down here. So... Yeah, speed's kind of my thing now, um, as far as my personal uh, personal training, because that's what I that's it's a more of a weakness for me, and it's something that I want to uh, develop and learn as much as possible about. So, yeah, there's been times in the past few years where it's like I probably should have been able to hit my head on the rim if mm -hmm. I was like jumping a lot. Yeah, but I really haven't jumped much myself um, in recent years. Yeah, so. Would you say besides like technique work, because some people might not have good jumping technique, but they have good running technique. Would you say like the faster you are, the higher you jump? Like they train, they equal, they correlate very well. Um, I mean, in the sense that like good athletes are good athletes, yes. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking like at two different good athletes, like one who's in track and one who's in jumping, uh, you, I mean, you'd be amazed at how slow a good two foot jumper can be. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, um, especially especially like you know outside of the first 10, 10 meters uh, mm -hmm. when you're looking into the top speed. Um, yeah, there's a huge separation there between two foot jumping and sprinting, um, and we could talk about you know a lot of reasons why. One of, big one being the ground contact time, right? You know, yeah. Two foot jumping, you got maybe three tenths of a second, three to four tenths, and top speed sprinting, you're looking at like a tenth of a second, and uh, yeah, so the the set of abilities required to be really fast at top speed is, you know, qu quite a bit different from from uh, two foot jumping. Yeah. Interesting. So if you're a jumper, like say like for me, like, you know how you said, if you get stronger, it's hard to get stronger, but if you get stronger, there's a good chance you can translate that to jumping higher. Um, mm -hmm. Would that be the same? Is that like how you train speed as well? Just like kind of get stronger and you'll get faster? Yes. Uh, yes. The same concept. Okay. Uh, 
different but looks. I would say that speed is a lot farther away from squatting than jumping is. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So that process might be um, one. You're gonna when you're lifting, you're gonna get like uh, a bigger performance decline in speed than you mm -hmm. are in jumping, probably. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if okay, you, yeah. you know, like I'm a I'm a big uh, deep squat guy, right? Deep squatting will mess with speed a lot more than it'll mess with a two foot jump. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. To me. Um, and then also it's gonna take. You might, you might, because of that, you might strength train for a shorter period of time, uh, and then it might also take a longer time to translate to that top speed improvement. Gotcha. Yeah. So whereas, you know, every situation is different, and I don't want to give like just a generic thing, but let's just say uh, for two foot jumping, somebody strength trains for twelve weeks, and then they don't strength train or they reduce strength training for six weeks. You know, maybe the sprinter strength trains for six weeks. And then they back off for 12. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, the proportions are different because, yeah, speed and and, uh, and squatting are much farther away from each other. Gotcha. That makes yeah. perfect sense to me. I kind of get the two foot jumping because it's so like powerful. It's like you don't need as much speed. You see so many people jump off two feet so high that don't use much speed. Yeah. Um, it's deep knee bend and it's not a ton of momentum a lot of times. Yeah. Um, so this is a tough one. A tough question for you probably is like, when you take that break, because like when you're lifting, say like for me, if I'm lifting and I'm doing well, like right now I added deep squats into my, I'm excited about it because I'm super weak at them. So like I've added deep squats into my routine. I'm jumping well, my squats are going well. I'm at like just 225 right now. Um, if like, how do I know when to take that break from lifting? Like, cause I kind of started, let's just say I started at like 185, my lifting phase or li adding lifting into my routine. If I get up to, I can, I see myself, getting because i think i've done 315 fully deep squat sure. um maybe a year ago now maybe over that but like if i get to that level like how do i know when to take that break off from lifting before i like and then get my elasticity back all the way up and then come back to lifting like how do i know when to take that break okay so yeah this is where we're getting into uh some of the you know they say the art and science of coaching this is where yeah. we're getting into more of the art um but I think so. What you would do is you would, obviously while you're going through that strength phase, you're going to be tracking your jumping ability, right? Right. And you're going to be seeing what is the impact of the strength on the jumping, okay? And then you would use your history as a reference point, okay? So let's say you squatted 315 before and you jumped uh, 41 inches, okay? Uh, if you then you get your squat up to 350 and you're jumping 38. Well, you know for sure there's some potential there, right? Okay. You know, just uh, assuming that you can uh, use some of that strength for some better jumping, you know that there's some potential there because you're jumping worse than you were at a, at a lower strength level. Right. Okay. Okay. So that would be one thing. You use your past numbers as reference points. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then, but then also you want to be in a situation where you need, you need the rest. Okay. So if you're if you're in the weight room and you're lifting, let's say twice a week, one heavy day, one light day, and you're feeling pretty good all the time, and you and uh, and the weights are going up, uh, you're not in a situation where you need rest. Yeah. You would want to then probably up your lifting volume and build up some fatigue for maybe four to six weeks before and during those four to six weeks expect to see a little performance decline yeah expect to see your, your weights don't keep going up yeah um and then that's when you would take a break because yeah you, you don't want that's another thing I, I don't think a lot of a lot of guys lift hard enough yeah to really earn that break i see what you mean i think i actually did my strength phase correctly but I was just so bummed at how low I was jumping because I, I it it dropped my vert a lot, and mm -hmm. I think, and then I tried to do like light lifting at, through that to kind of like like taper off instead of just drop it, and yeah, yeah. I did jump my highest like a couple months after, but it it like it always goes back to like what if I just jump my hardest like will that increase my vertical because that's how a lot of my career has been is just jump my hardest and that helps mm -hmm. me increase so it's like I never know for sure if it was the lifting or the or the just jumping a lot but it does make sense that like I did take that break yeah yeah so there's always that um, 
interpretation of events, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and that's, again, that's why there's not, like, a hard, fast formula for this kind of thing. It's always like, all right, this is what we did, this is what happened, okay, but what exactly caused that? Yeah. You know, we're, we're, and so it's, like, just a constant experiment uh, and, hope, you know, constantly learning process, hopefully. Um, yes. But, yeah, I would say using, the, using those past measures as a reference point is, is a big thing. Like, so sometimes people say... Hey, I like you know I get tons of emails and yeah. messages and stuff, and it's like, hey, I squat three hundred and I jump you know thirty four inches or whatever. Do you think I should stop lifting? Well, based on what you just told me, I have no idea. You know, it's <laughs> exactly. like, uh, have you questions. have you ever squatted three hundred before? You yeah. know, how high did you jump then? Um, I get those questions. Like, did, have you been lifting for a month or have you been lifting for six months? Yeah, you know, like, it's too many so variables that I need on that. But yeah, so you got to you got to use your your own sort of you know your own um, like translation of strength. Mm -hmm. Use that as a guideline because yeah. So okay, so I weigh about two twenty, two twenty five. If I squat three hundred and fifty and I jump thirty seven inches on an approach or something, uh, somebody else might squat three hundred and fifty and jump forty. Right. You know, we're not going to be on the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah necessarily the same uh scale because we're very you know everybody's a different person so yeah you got to use your own okay you know this is how much strength i need to jump this high if i get past that strength i know there should be some more potential there yes yeah I, that's what i gotta do um yeah i <laughs> get those questions too they just ask you like such a generic question you have you don't know who they are and it's like such a individualistic type of training that just cracks me up um but yeah, I definitely think that's what I got to do. I got to increase my strength. Um, and so when you drop it and you do like a, you pause and you kind of drop lifting, do you just completely drop it ent ent entirely? Or do you like to do like kind of like maybe the same motions, but super light just so you like, you kind of maintain some strength or what are your thoughts on like the dropping of it? So yeah, there's another highly individual situation, right? Um, I would say, okay, so... A story from the past uh, that guy Chris we talked about, yeah. right? He used to do, uh, you know, we, we were in college, so we'd do like a, a semester of lifting, right? So it'd be like three to four months. And then he would uh, he'd go back home for the summer. He just play basketball. And like six to eight weeks later, one day he would just like, boom, his vert would just shoot up. So in his case, he was like not touching a weight for a couple months, right? Yeah. Um, in his case also though, he had a high strength level, you know, he was like five, six, one thirty-five. So he was, <laughs> he was squatting over double body weight, right? So he had some more, he had some more strength reserve where, yeah. okay, if his squat comes down 20 pounds, cause he's not lifting, he's still super not, strong. not as big of a deal for him. Right. Yeah. Um, somebody, let's say a taller athlete, let's, let's say myself, you know, if I am lifting pretty hard and I squat like maybe I get up to like 1.75 times body weight. Yeah. If I stop lifting entirely and I let that slip down, the end result on athleticism is not real great. You know, I might like, I'm going to shift by stop lifting or by not lifting. I'm going to shift more explosive. I'm going to get more elastic, but if I lose strength, my jumping might end up pretty stagnant, pretty mm -hmm. much the same or even go down. Um, there may be some other measure of athleticism I could do in there that I would be like, you know, clearly increasing during that time. But uh, yeah, you, you do run the risk of losing the strength. So that's where, uh, for me, the solution that I've done successfully is I keep in power exercises. Okay. So that would be where like uh, I use a hang snatch or a jerk or if it wasn't, you know, cause I like the Olympic lifts, so I do those, but if it's somebody else, it could just be, uh, you know, barbell jump squats or mm, okay. jumps with a hex bar or, things of that nature where it's a, it's a strength stimulus cause it is an additional load. Um, but it's not slow. It's explosive, right? And, and, and it's not fatiguing at all. Okay. Gotcha. So it really, you're not, you don't really get the negative impact of strength training if you're doing, yeah, like jump squats or hang snatches or things like that. Okay. Um, and that can help to, yeah, maintain that strength level while you're doing the, the explosive and the elastic training. Yeah. That's so, that's so interesting, man. It just seems like the more I learn, the more it's like 
points to so individual but it's cool because it's like i'm trying to figure out myself and like help others and it's just like it's so tough to just tell somebody like you said if they ask like hey i can do this and then like you have to be like hey what's your whole history where you know right. and like what are you doing currently so it's just it's so it's so fascinating but it's it's really i'm really um learning a lot already um now i kind of want to move on because i i got i feel like i got most of your principles i kind of got a good game plan yeah go ahead can i say one more thing on that As, whatever you want to say with the uh with the backing off lifting, the other thing we got to be aware of is like structural integrity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, uh, if you have someone who's got a relatively low strength level, let's say someone's around one and a half on the squat, their knees probably are not like super mm. bulletproof, right? Um, so when they're, you know, peaking, when they're doing the, like the explosive phase, they should probably still keep something in there for, for uh, the quad tendon health, right? Yes. Um, and that could be maybe a, a single leg squat. So again, it's body weight. It's not going to be real fatiguing. Could be sled pushes, could be the reverse sled drags, things of that. But it, again, it would be something that we're addressing the structural integrity there. Yes. Because again, that's another danger that you, that you have when you just back off strength entirely. Are mm -hmm. you just going to let some of your structures uh, decline here? Um, so that's one more point on that. Yeah, sure. Anyway. And I got to add on to that, that you have saved many lives with that rectus femoris stretch. I've learned from you. <laughs> I've passed that on to everyone I knew because like the second, like my knee pain actually didn't go away, but that helped like bring it down to the lowest I can get it with stretching. And then the last little bit for me was diet. Like the actual, I don't know if you knew about like that wheat and gluten, like inflammation type sure, deal. Yeah. That like felt like it kicked the kicked the rest out of it for me. But I know Andy Nicholson's a huge proponent of it. The over the hill dunker, he's my man. And we like, every time someone has knee pain, that's like the first thing I do. So I'm just like, so thankful I found that on your thing. It was like so interesting that there was like a muscle you're missing. And I've always, as soon as I had knee pain, it was like the first thing I found. It was cool. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, it's it's interesting, like because we're supposed to have to like put an appropriate load on the tendon to make mm -hmm. it heal or whatever. But there's some situations where a tight muscle just makes something hurt, and then you loosen it, and it's just it's better. Yeah, it's like magic. Uh, and it's hard to say exactly, you know, what's different about that situation versus another. But yeah, I mean, certainly stretching is not like an end all be all cure for, for mm -hmm. tendonitis. But uh, yeah, some situations, it seems to be like a big trigger, especially if someone's starting out tight. Yes. Yeah. Uh, are you getting into more besides just like strength and training? Are you getting into like, like the cellular level cellular level of like tendons and things like that to try to figure out injuries and stuff like that? Uh, I mean, I certainly have explored it. Um, I do where I work, I do one-on-one -on -one training. So it's like, it's very much whatever the athlete needs. Right. So, um, and well that, and then through obviously having like a jump based website, I've had a lot of people ask me about uh, knee pain. So, uh, yeah, I've done a fair amount of like physical therapy, I guess you could say, um, in, in that, in the knee department and also in, in other, other areas too. Yeah. Some, some of the problems in the human body are, you know, it's like, pretty much universal concepts across the board from physical therapy to athletic training to athletic development. Like, it's like, okay, can we, do we know how to lengthen a muscle and put an appropriate load on it? You know, like that's, there's a lot of crossover knowledge there. So yeah, I certainly, I'm, I mean, I'm not a physical therapist, but I do some therapy if right. the person in front of me needs it. Yes. And uh, yeah, a, a decent amount of experience with knee pain for sure. That's super cool. Um... Yeah, I mean, God, I just, I just like, I went back to, the, I was just thinking like genetic limit and things like that is like, it like from talking to you, it doesn't seem like there is a real limit. It's just like you said, you hit that wall of like lifting. It's so hard to just kind of keep pushing your body to get stronger. And some bodies aren't, it's hard to like stay healthy and all these different factors to get stronger. So it's pretty cool. So Duncan community, what are your thoughts? You ever see yourself trying to like get into it, like try new dunks? I remember you used to elbow hang and all those type of things. Like, are you intrigued by like the, like kind of like the little community we have? Well, it's not so little anymore, but um, of like trying new dunks or like these new like double elbows, like does that spark you at all? Yeah, um, <laughs> I would, I would say that, I mean, dunking's awesome, man. Yeah. I love dunking. Uh, for yeah, for me personally, it's like I've gone after, kind of gone towards the speed side, and I guess at times, kind of like gone away from my roots, which is pretty depressing. But uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I still think like, dude, just get a 50 inch vert, man. Yeah. Like, why not? Uh -huh. um, but then at the same time, it's like if you have the if I have a 50 inch vert and I'm still slow, I'm gonna uh, be so you're you're more a little bit more about speed than jumping right now. Like it's just yeah, just just personally. That's interesting because I see myself too. Like I want to be fast too, and I want to be like even basketball. Like I just want to be really good at playing. But I mm -hmm. never, I don't like the amount I do jumping and jump training is like it's a fraction how much I play basketball compared to that. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah I just uh, I guess kind of the thought that I have is if I, you know, because I've had a, I've had some small success in the speed department. I think it's tough when you don't do it for the first 25 years of your life. Yeah. You start, but, um, I guess sort of the dream I have is, okay, keep progressing in that area mm -hmm. and then turn into a one foot jumper yes. and, then, and then turn into a free throw line jumper. Yes. That's sort of my, like my, you know, distant goal, which I don't know if can be achieved when you're already in your thirties yeah. and haven't done it your whole life. But, uh, do you have yeah. um, a 40 time goal? Yeah, like 3.0. What? <laughs> That's like a Tesla. Somebody just somebody just asked me uh, on my last Instagram video if I had any personal goals. I was like 9.0 in the 100 meters. Yeah. I don't I don't have a I don't have any realistic goals yeah. put it that way. That's good. I, I like the unrealistic I ones. Keep getting better and yeah, I'm never really I guess satisfied with it. That's awesome. So uh, have you learned to, like so, okay, so this is a good question. So did you, when you comes to speed training, like you're trying to get faster as a sprinter or you're trying to get better as a dunker, do you need, when you do the elastic training, do you do a lot of plyometrics or do you like to do the actual activity a lot? Uh, definitely gravitate towards the activity. Um, so, and then, I mean, depending on the activity. All right, so it's, again, if we're talking about dunking, I would say gravitate towards the activity except for maybe only doing the activity all the time is tougher on the knees. Mm -hmm. So then maybe we replace some dunking with some sprinting. Yes. Or we replace some dunking with uh, some type of plyometric that is uh, less knee bending, right? So we have less knee stress. Um, and the, But then also like when we do plyometrics or if we're going to do a plyometric, let's have a good reason to do it. Yeah. Meaning, let's get a stimulus that's at least different in some way, and yes. we're not just recreating the same thing. Yes. So if I let's say I do two dunk sessions a week, if I then go do box jumps, like, yeah, I was gonna say like, what am I really getting out of that? I guess I'm not I'm not dealing with the landings, right? So that's yes. I guess less knee stress. But as far as like a training stimulus, there's not really anything there. Yes, I was going to say, you said it in a much better way. It's like, it's the same stimulus. But when I think of it as like two foot jumping, I do that all the time when I dunk. So when I do plyometrics, I try to do like more lateral movements and like single legs. So I try to do like more single leg stuff and try to do things that I'm not doing from the same two foot jump. Now you said less knee bend to do like less stress as a plyometric. Can you give some examples of those? Okay, so like, um, all right, so say we're doing some type of repetitive jump, right? Mm-hmm. We could, do a, we could do a repetitive jump where we're dropping down pretty low and jumping as high as we can. Or we could do a repetitive jump with like stiff legs where you're mm. barely bending your knees and you're popping off the ground super quick. Mm. And that's going to be less knee stress. It's also going to give you, again, like a different stimulus. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I would gravitate towards plyometrics that are, you know, have some type of difference to them. Um, another example would be like a, like a drop jump. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's not so much in the exercise, but the execution, like let's do a drop jump for short contact time mm -hmm. instead of a, if I, you know, say I do a 24 inch drop jump for max height, it's going to be a lot like an approach vertical, you know, there's yeah. not a whole lot of difference there. Yes. Maybe if I take that drop jump up to 48 inches, now it's turning into at least, okay, so we're not reducing knee stress now, yeah. but we're, we're creating a stimulus that's at least you know, more intense than uh, yes. just an approach jump. Um, but then I think like what you said with the single leg things mm -hmm. is good, right? So I do some single leg bounding uh, yes. where I'm pretty quick off the ground. I'm on one leg. So again, uh, less knee stress, unless I put too much speed on it, right? If I start trying to do triple jump, now we're up in the knee stress quite a bit. Um, yeah, single leg things and then things getting quick off the ground. Those would be like examples of where, yeah, we're, we're reducing the stress, but we're also creating a stimulus that's different in a, in a way at least.
That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That sounds that sounds exactly what I thought. Sprinting too. Sprinting is great, dude. I mean, I don't do it enough, but um um it just seems like so simple and like it but it's so great cuz it's just like it's it's good because it has like pure explosion for like a solid 20 seconds however long you sprint and it's just great yeah yeah. um also stretching do you stretch like the same day you just lifted or do you or do you do the next day how do you do do you have like an active recovery day what's your like kind of recovery methods um all right so stretching so i'm a fan of like you know getting to a certain level of flexibility through uh through stretching and through strength training with range of motion Mm -hmm. right like that's a big piece of it too it's not it's not just stretching um because strength training with range of motion actually like literally lengthens your muscles in the sense that like it puts more links in the chain so to speak interesting um so then it's like you have more range of motion without even necessarily stretching okay so there's like a structural adaptation to uh strength training that does that it's called sarcomerogenesis not that anybody cares <laughs> i care yeah um, i'm gonna look into it <laughs> uh so yeah so through strength training with range of motion and through stretching i'd like to get to a certain level of flexibility um and during that process i would say stretching can be like all the time you know it can be pre-workout post-workout uh before bed when you wake up like anytime even before like jumping or not like explosive well that's that's the one caveat like not not immediately before explosive um so yeah okay so not pre-workout let's just say but post-workout or like any other time besides pre-workout and you can do it like a ton yeah um when you get to a acceptable level of flexibility like for me myself i'm not necessarily trying to improve my flexibility anymore uh i actually don't stretch much Mm -hmm. i'll do like two minutes at the at like post workout and that and that's generally yeah. it unless like maybe something starts to bother me or something I yeah. might explore it a little bit with some stretching but like um yeah and, and it is stretching a recovery method uh i mean theoretically yeah we could say you're helping to like move fluid out of the area um so if you did some type of like repetitive stretching motion um we could call that a recovery method uh, is it going to be better than like just putting your feet up on the couch? Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. I mean, so it's more just like I'm, it's like maintenance. I've heard you say stretching's like maintenance, right? Keeps your muscles healthy. Sure. It's not really recovering them, but it just kind of keeps them healthy. Yeah, and keeps them from tightening up because there are certain things yeah. that like, um, like sprinting, for example. If you just let's say you let's say you run track and you just run and run and sprint like all week long for several months, like your hamstrings will tighten up if you don't do anything about it. Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, there's that sort of that maintenance, but yeah, is it really a recovery method? I, you could probably turn it into again if you're doing the repetitive stretching over and over, you're getting blood flow. I think you could you could say it is, um, but that's not something I use much. Okay. Um, my personally, my recovery methods and, and like what I preach to people is sleeping and eating. Yes, um, those are the big things, and and then well, and also just like not overtraining, right? But yeah. um, yeah eating man eating is <laughs> you also another thing i learned from you protein shakes are, are bullshit so i stopped drinking <laughs> those which <laughs> those though that saves me because i would drink these ones that are just disgusting because i was on a budget as well and i was just like trying to get the protein i needed and then when you said that i'm like i'm done i'm done i haven't drank them yeah. since so did i say did i use that one i don't know i might that's that might be my oh. interpretation after I read the... okay let me let me clarify yeah. uh there's nothing wrong with protein shakes, yeah. but you don't need protein shakes yes. to get protein. There's mm-hmm. nothing special about that protein. Um, but yeah, protein in your diet is actually super important. Yes. Um, this is one of the things that, like, one of the battles that I fight with the like the high schoolers that I train, right, is uh, are you getting enough calories and are you getting enough protein? Because um, these kids work out so much. Yeah. And, yeah, that's, like, one of the biggest things sometimes – you know, if you, let's say you, uh, we got, I got kids who are working out like twice a day, you know, like all week long. And if you're doing that, you should be eating probably your body weight times about 25 in calories per day. Right. So if you're a 150 pound kid, what does that translate to? Like Uh, uh, 4,000 calories or something. Uh, that was quick math. Um, uh, and, and most kids aren't eating that many calories. Right. Yeah. But then also, 
if you're if you work out that much, you should probably be going like more than a gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. Yeah. And most people aren't doing that either. Most a lot of people are doing half of that. Yeah. Because their their diet is you know a lot more carb based than protein based. Um, so yeah, that's those are a couple things that I that's like the biggest battle that I fight. And one of the one of the I guess yeah recovery methods probably the biggest recovery method that I promote is just eating. Yeah. Um, you'd be amazed what your body can do when you eat enough. Yeah. And how you can bounce how you can bounce back from things and how you can sustain performance through things. Um, yeah, I got you know people who are. Uh, you know, soccer players who, who like have soccer practice and have conditioning and they're wondering what extra conditioning workouts they should do to get in better shape. Yeah. And it's like, no, man, you need to eat more. Like really? if you want to sustain performance throughout a, you know, a 60 minute game or a 90 minute game, uh, you need some freaking Load calories. Up. Yeah. So, so yeah, and so it's just a big thing uh, for a lot of reasons. Like you really got to eat. Um, yeah, I have a couple <laughs> of questions on diet. Actually, I have yeah. a few more on recovery. Actually, but I'm gonna go back, start with diet. So, have you done any like intermittent fasting? Are you into that at all? I did try it uh, a couple years ago and didn't have. Well, I mean, I guess what exactly was I going for? I guess I was like trying to get a little, a little more shredded, and didn't really have success with it. Um, and definitely, looking back, was not eating enough. Yeah. So if I was gonna try it again, I would say, all right, well, you're gonna have to get those five thousand calories in that, Damn, in, that 5, in that feeding window, you know, dude. Uh, so yeah, I. I'd be very hesitant to recommend it to somebody yeah. for performance purposes. Yeah. Um, certainly there's a lot of people who get lean with it mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, yeah, you're, you know, creating a caloric deficit. Like, yeah, it should work theoretically. Uh, but athletic performance, man, I would not be inclined to, to advocate that. Um, just because I'm thinking about, they need to not only do, do we need to, you know, make it through workouts, but you need to respond to them. Yes. You know, if, if you're trying to get stronger and you're like flirting with under eating, that's, yeah. uh, that's, that's just counterproductive. So I actually do it pretty much every day, but I work out about the same time every day around noon usually. And I mm -hmm. eat plenty. Like I, th I don't even eat that many calories, but what's different for me is that I, cause I never, I, when I started it, there was some, not when I started it, but I actually felt more like I was under eating when I wasn't fasting because I was like trying to eat a meal but like three to four hours before. And if I didn't get that meal, the other meal wasn't as nutritious either. So it was more about like healthier eating as well. So now it's like I have a lot of sweet potatoes. I have a lot of quinoa like the night before. And then the morning I don't eat. And I feel great because I wake up, I get cleaned out, and then I, I'm like completely empty. And I have full energy every workout. And I feel like – I feel – I get hungry sometimes, like before the workout, like when I first wake up, but like, I just feel optimal for working out. Like I don't have any, like sometimes I would eat too close, you know, like it's hard to time it. So sometimes I would eat a meal too close and get like a cramp, but I just feel, I, I feel like I'm, I have a good, uh, consistent feeling of working out now. So I'm liking it, but it is tough sometimes to get the calories. Sure. So yeah, I would say, so one thing, yeah, like if it's, if intermittent fa fasting means that you're being intentional with your diet versus not being intentional, like, yeah. you know, good. Um, also, you know, if there's someone who's going to be able to do it well, it would be someone like yourself who's, you know, an, an independent athlete, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not bound to a training schedule yes. or a traveling schedule with a team. Yeah. You don't have, you know, three-hour practices, uh, you know, things of that nature to deal with. Um, so yeah, I could see how someone who is, you know, in co complete control of their own training schedule and their yeah. own nutrition, like, you know, if you have everything set up right, I could see how it could be done successfully. Absolutely. Especially you talk about like loading up on carbs yes. that night, the night before, um, that makes sense then that you're able to, um, you know, have a good workout the next day, even without eating breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I definitely think you can make it work. Yeah. Do you have, um, when you have like athletes, it is part of the, you're like training with them is like, if they might be a little overweight or like their body fat's a little high, would you try to help them with their diet as well? Is that like a big part of it? 
or is like the yeah, or is like the yeah. elastic training a lot of times. I know at high intensity type training, a lot of cuts them up anyway. But yeah. Yeah. So I would say I definitely have people where body comp is relevant. Mm-hmm. Um, and even when I guess even when they don't have an issue in that area, I always ask them. I always explore that area about nutrition because I I want them to be successful, even if it's not you know like uh me helping them mm-hmm. M- maybe if it's like hey you need to go see a nutritionist i want them to do that yeah because i want them to be successful so yeah it's definitely something i address with people now um i don't generally be like oh yeah i'll make you a diet plan yeah um i've done it like once or twice or at least like just giving them kind of like a here eat these things <laughs> and don't eat these things i've yeah. done that but uh I'm generally not trying to do a bunch of extra work for free. You know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I definitely talk about it with people, and I encourage them uh, to to take certain strategies. Um, but I don't try to like turn myself into a a, a nutritionist or. Right. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't need people like texting me what they should eat for lunch. Y'all, you know, like I I don't need that. So. Yeah. Um, and when it's also not the business that I work for, you know, it's mm-hmm. like we're a speed training play or like a athletic development place and it's not, um, yeah. the owner's kind of like, this is what we do. We have a niche and, you know, we're not trying to like, um, Brain shattered all with the yeah, turn our, turn ourselves into some, well, he's always like, you got to get better before you get bigger. Right. Yes. So you don't just span, just don't just pretend you can do things yeah. or that you're <laughs> but at this like. Um, yeah, so I mean, I definitely talk to people about it. I encourage them to do certain things, but I don't, I don't like step outside of myself too much. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so with diet and reco- and recovery too is like, so let me give you a little example of my weekend was because it was very heavy training. I did like Thursday was a dunk session. I jumped like 60 times. It mm-hmm. was a ton of jumps. And then Friday, I felt good. And since it was like a di- different stimulus, even though it was like squats, I did squats heavy. I did some single leg deadlifts. The workout felt great. I had good energy and things like that. And then Saturday, I ended up going to the gym as well and did some, played some pickup and did some more jumping. Not as much jumping, but just played a couple games of pickup. And it was just like – and then today I went again, a little more jumping, but more just like short approach, working on like footwork and stuff like that. So now I'm like pretty worked – what would you say is like a good, like, do you have like an active recovery day? Cause usually I like to do something. It's hard for me to like, just like sit at home. Would do you have like workouts or what, what do you think about like an active recovery? So, uh, I'm a little bit anti-active recovery. Interesting. Actually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's just based on my experience. There's actually a fair amount of research, I guess, to support like hopping on an exercise bike or mm-hmm. something like that and just moving. Um, in my experience, man, if I like with myself and other people, uh, sedentary people come back really well mm-hmm. from workouts, like it, take a couple days and just like, don't exercise. Uh, it, it works at least in, in my experience and with some, you know, a lot of the people that I, that I've worked with. Um, so I'm not one to say, Hey, you should go do this for recovery tomorrow. There certainly are people that, that, uh, believe in that type of thing like uh yeah and basically it's anything that's blood flow related right yes um like like sled pushes and pulls are something are a thing that people have done for like active recovery and it's like man this doesn't feel like recovery yeah it you feels know? like a little wor- bit of a workout <laughs> um, so but but realistically like a sled push and a sled pull while they may burn your quads to death like it's actually pretty easy on your body yeah um so it makes sense but Man, I just like the I like the feeling that I get, and I like the the results that I see from other people, like just not working out for a couple of days. Yes, it definitely so. goes back to the individual individual stuff, but I've definitely felt that as well. But for me, it's the only thing is that I'm so inflexible that it feels like if I did a heavy workout and like I push my muscles like that, it's like if I don't like I don't really I barely break a sweat, but I basically just do some like dynamic leg kicks some like mm-hmm. floor touches, just things like that to like stretch the muscle a little bit. If I don't do that, it feels like they, instead of getting looser the next day, they get tighter. So that's basically the, the gist of what and, I do. And that's another thing. Like I wouldn't count stretching as a workout at all. Okay. Yeah. I guess, I guess, you know, technically it is exercise. Yeah. Uh, but uh, 
Yeah, I, I would say this. I wouldn't say, okay, you should lay in bed all day. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, you should, like, be a human being. You should like, rest you know? yourself and, and not pretty, pretty, like, give a stimulus, but not, like, stay yeah. completely still. Like, like get up, go, <laughs> go to work. Go for a walk. You know, like, yeah. 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 Um, so, I guess, in that sense, active recovery, yeah. I, I guess I'm, I'm not someone to tell somebody to do a workout for recovery Definitely. purposes. So... Uh, yeah. I'm, I have another tough one that's like back to the art of the training. Um, huh. I'm big on pushing myself. It's hard for me to rest. Um, I'm, I've gotten pretty good to see when I'm overtraining, but it's still a struggle is like, how can you kind of tell when your CNS is burnt out? Like, is there a good like method that you feel in yourself that you're like, okay, my central nervous system's kind of fried. Okay. So, that's where I would look at, you're going to look at your explosive abilities mm. um, in particular compared to your strength. Okay. Okay. So, well, again, we're, we're using sort of like phrases that are not clearly defined, like burnt out, right? I, I mean, what does that mean exactly? I, so I, I would say if, you're, if your performance is down across the board, that's yeah. obviously a pretty good indicator, Yeah. right? But there will be times where someone might be strong. Uh, so let's say your squat's good, right? But then you do something, even even something strength-based, like a, for me, that would be like a hang snatch, right? If my squat's good and my hang snatch is average, I know that some rest is going to make me a little more explosive and make that hang snatch pop up. Or if my strength's good and my broad jump is down or my standing vertical is down, um yeah th that's i guess that would be like the earlier sign of fatigue okay because okay. somebody you know again if your performance is down across the board it's pretty obvious yes. but before that happens you're going to have your explosive ability be down yes okay so, you so, can be, yeah. so like so for example like if i went to the gym and you're this is kind of like you're kind of diagnosing yourself over a few day period right is that what i'm getting like sure so yeah like I mean, if i squatted if i squatted friday am i sure yeah, so if I squatted like Friday, strength was good, but then I go to the gym and like my my explosiveness went a little down. That could it be from the workout, or I'm just kind of fatigued, and you think that the explosiveness will come up when I rest, something like that. Is that what you're kind of? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, okay, so I'm 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 saying uh, if you're okay, yeah, your squat was good. You're saying the next day. Yeah, like the next time I go jump, I guess the next day. Well, should you? Okay. That's another question. I know we're kind of branching off a million different ways, but like, if I squatted right. heavy Friday, should I go jump the next day if I have like good energy when I wake up, or should I wait? Like, should I know that like, okay, I put in work on Friday, I'm gonna need rest because I know what I just put out. Like, I, I hit new numbers. Like, should I rest before I go jump again? Uh, I mean, you could, you could not. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say that like that specific day matters so much it's more about like the big picture okay okay so uh, it'd be more like well you should rest at some point okay but if you want to rest the next day but but so the other thing though was like you could go the next day and have a great jump session yes that's my like, problem that, is that i've had those that, great days and i'm <laughs> like so when i have like a great lift day the next day i'm like well i've had a great jumping day this day i could have one today i don't want to postpone it because i'm trying to get the gains sooner than later right right yeah um so yeah, I would I would just say be really sensitive about the yeah again it's you're comparing things right mm -hmm. and maybe we're talking about over the course of weeks but uh, it, like try to try to identify like the trend yes okay so like if I'm okay so I'm going through a, a phase let's say where I'm squatting three days a week I'm trying to get the squat up right while I'm doing that I'm also sprinting jumping snatching. Um, over the course of these weeks, let's say my squat keeps going up, uh, but those other things kind of, you know, they go up a little bit and then they kind of stall out. Maybe they're still good, but they're not like going up with my squat. Yeah. Like I could just keep going okay. and, stay, and stay good. But the thing is, if my squat went up, like uh, I'm thinking these other things should go up with it. Yes. And if they're not, that to me is a sign, okay, there's uh, some level of fatigue and that's influencing my uh, explosiveness or my elasticity, my, my ability to do things fast. Yeah. 
even though I'm still able to grind out good strength, that fatigue is going to influence those speed ability, abilities first. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I, I would just, again, you're kind of using those reference points like, okay, you know, squatting 300 translates to uh, standing vert 32. If my squat's at 330, my standing vert's still at 32. That's good. Yeah. The standing vert's good, but yeah. could it be better? Yes. Can I get if I rest? Am I going to get a, a, an increase in speed abilities? Yes. That's kind of yeah. That's sort of the so it's, it's testing and asking yes. questions like what's going to happen if I do this? Yeah. Okay. That okay. That makes sense. Okay. So now back to just a, maybe to, as a conclusion because it's been a while. I don't want to keep you too long. As yeah. a big picture thing, you're going to want to strength train usually because people are like that's where they can build up once they get their max jumping. You can jump a lot. You do the strength training. You back off of it to try to get your elasticity back up, and you kind of just keep doing that cycle. Is that kind of the basic cycle, very big picture? Yes. I mean, that is that is the model that I try to use. Um, it looks a lot different in different situations. Right. Um, but that that is the model. And, yeah, so it's um, – and I've got a video. It's the – explosive performance window the period yep that changed yeah. my whole view on strength training yeah. so it's uh I, I like to start out assuming people are healthy like again let's find out how athletic can you be at this strength level okay let's maximize that okay if uh, you know if somebody has like a history of strength training yes and they're, and they're kind of like lost like what do i what do i do now should i jump more should i squat more like it, you know they're kind of in the middle and they don't know Let's just start out by maximizing your athleticism at the current strength level. And then, uh, and now we know, or, you know, we're pretty sure, like, we're not going to get more from just, like, jumping still. Mm -hmm. Right? Then we add some strength, and then we do it again. Yes. We add some strength, and then we do it again. And, yeah, I feel like people kind of get caught up, like, trying to do both at the same time too much. Yeah. And I, I think people maybe are not, not persistent enough on like, okay, let's be, like I said before, let's make the light or let's make the heavy weights feel not so heavy anymore. Mm -hmm. Like let's get, let's, let's be a different athlete in the weight room. You know, like I'm stronger, more powerful, like on all the lifts, like across the board. Yeah. Not just like, oh, I got, I got three good, good uh, weeks of strength in here. But like, no, <laughs> I'm actually me. like a different, <laughs> like I'm a different athlete now. Yeah. Um, even if I'm not necessarily more athletic already, but I'm like clearly different in, in the strength department. Yeah. Um, so first of all, do that well enough. Right. But then also do the other side well enough. Mm -hmm. Like now actually back off enough, actually rest enough to maximize what you can do with that new strength level. Instead of just like sort of always going after both or yes. always kind of bouncing back and forth between them. Like that's, I guess that's sort of my, my philosophy or whatever is like, yeah. Let's do the two ends of the spectrum as well as they can be done. Yes. Um, yeah. So like, let's, okay. What's the, you know, like the, the king of the strength exercises is like the deep squat. Like let's deep squat and let's totally change ourselves with the deep squat. Um, but then now that we have all this strength, like let's back way off of that. Yeah. And let's totally maximize how athletic we can be with this strength. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of like two extreme ends of the spectrum. Whereas, you know, a lot of the other people in the field, and again, if you make it work, you make it work. Like people, you know, there's other people having success. A lot of the people, you know, they tend to operate more in the middle where, okay, we're doing both things at the same time or we're doing more specific strength training, right? right? We're doing like our jump squats and our quarter squats. We're doing sort of that in-between stuff. And, uh, and yeah, I just tend to gravitate towards like, let's do the two ends of the spectrum as well as they can be done. Um, and, and, you know, step by step, work our way up to elite levels. Yes. That's great, man. Um, I don't want to take any more of your time. That was really good information. I'm definitely going to probably listen to this again because I, it's just so much good stuff, man. I really appreciate you helping out. Do you do like online training? I know you have your online program still, right? Do you do like one-on-one -on -one training online or is that just your facility? Um, so there was a time where I did uh where i kind of well i sort of needed to to survive yeah. uh <laughs> now that i've got like pretty you know pretty good employment situation i try not to do the one-on-one -on -one training 
because in the past I haven't really liked it that much. Mm-hmm. Um, I like it in theory. I like the idea of it, but what it turns out to be it just isn't what what I want it to be. Right. Um, I end up kind of flying blind a mm-hmm. lot because people just don't they just don't give me the information I want, and right. it's like you know they'll finish a week of workouts and I'll be like, hey, what happened this week? Like, oh, it was good. What should I do Monday? Yeah. <laughs> Like I didn't see a, I, mean, I didn't see a single exercise. Yeah, I don't have a single measurement from the week. Yeah, I just you know so yeah I just I haven't historically enjoyed it very much. Um, occasionally somebody will still talk me into it. Yeah. Um, this past like this past summer I've had a, a college sprinter and a college basketball player um, that I've been programming for, and um, and that was it was fine. Uh, and, and they both, I think, are set up pretty good, you know, for their, their next season. Um, but it's not something I seek out, not something I'm really looking to do more of. Um, yeah, I, I tend to just refer people to my website. I've got, you know, the uh, jump training programs on there. And that um, tends to be, you know, it's obviously it's not individualized, but it's at least categorized. Right. You've got the evaluation process. and that tends to like give people a pretty good model for what they're supposed to do. Right. Um, and that's why, you know, people have had success with that. So yeah, I, I, I tend to say like, Hey, look, man, if I write you a personalized program, it's going to end up looking sort of like what the program on my website looks like. Yeah. So why don't you just pay this first. one small fee one time instead yeah. of trying to pay me every month? Yeah. To, you know, when I'm, Depending on how much you give me, I may or may not even be able to give you something better than what's there already. So, exactly. um, yeah, I don't love the one-on-one online training unless maybe if somebody actually like, you know, gave me more information, I would like yeah. it more. Um, but then that just means more work for me too. So yeah. it's kind of a <laughs> happy where yeah. you are. What I would about... rather, I guess, have the uh, you know the program just totally automated. Yes. How People about? Can go get- and they don't actually have to interact with me at all. So that's, that, that's that fun. would be really cool. <laughs> um, uh, what about YouTube videos? Are you going to make any more YouTube videos? Dude, I occasionally do. YouTube's kind of dead though, man. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's a, there is a need for this. I mean, there's a whole new community coming. I mean, I don't have the science, no pun intended, that you have. And I think it's really cool. And I know people love more and more information. I just feel like I know jump training is kind of figured out, but it's like, there's always case studies, you know, there's like individuals. Yeah. And so like for you, it was like that Chris, your friend, Chris was like really fun to watch. Cause you got to see like him, like he's super strong. It's such a lightweight. That's like a unique case. So those are kind of things that would be cool to see. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, <laughs> I'm always like, yeah, you should make a YouTube video on this. And it just doesn't, doesn't happen. happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, tend to be, yeah, nowadays it's like I'm kind of caught up with the training the actual people in person and not filming them all the time, I guess. You know, it's just like, yeah, just kind of in a different environment than when I was in college and just like hanging out with other college kids and, you know, like, right. hey, I'm going to take this video of you, you know, cool, like yeah. it's all good. Now I'm in like an actual business setting, you know, it's so it's a little different, I guess. It's cool. That but yeah, seems I, like I you... absolutely should make more youtube videos man <laughs> yeah it, but i was gonna say it just seems like you made it where you wanted to be and it's always cool when someone like you you see you said you want to do training early on and now that's where you're at and that's really cool man it's i mean i just love people that are just like training others because they just love it themselves they want other people to like have success it's pretty cool yeah uh i'm not changing careers anytime soon I'll awesome. say <laughs> all right man well thank you so much i appreciate all your information i appreciate you ha- spending time with me here and i look forward to more information and uh working with you too i'm gonna definitely bug you with some more questions show you my squats things like that <laughs> so i appreciate it man right. thanks a lot we'll talk soon man I'm good. have a good one man take it easy oh that's the anthem right there tried to make an intro ended up making an anthem